this video we're going to talk about the Reichert UBM ultrasonic biomicroscopy or high frequency ultrasound for looking at the anterior aspects of the eye. Here's the Reichert probe. There is a cover on the front of, of this probe. It's removable and must be fully seated against this silver pin right here. Note that on the side here that there's a line, there's a moving nub that moves in the same orientation, waggling back and forth as this line. This line will be on the left-hand side of the screen wherever this points to. This nub has a gold surface to it, and because it's moving in a liquid medium, it needs to be distilled water. If it's not using distilled water, then mineral deposits from normal tap water would deposit on here over time, ruining this nub. The nub can be 35 megahertz and it's also interchangeable for higher frequency of up to 50 megahertz. I'd like to talk just briefly about the older method in which uh, we examine the eye and that's called the shell and gel technique. In that technique the patient would be supine a open shell which is an open cylinder made of plastic, hard plastic, is inserted into the eye subsequent to the installation of topical anesthesia. A few drops of a viscous gel such as goniosol is placed around the inside of the shell to form a seal and then liquid is added. And then in that case that the operator would take the probe and position it into the uh, into the open shell uh, literally a quarter of a, an inch uh, from the corneal surface and it's waggling back and forth. A problem with that open shell technique, the shell and gel technique, is that for instance in the glaucoma patient when you're interested in looking at angles, it requires the patient to look over to the side, up, down, left, or right. As the patient does that, the bottom uh, rim of that shell scrapes along the epithelial layer, the first layer of the cornea, and causes an abrasion. Patients hate that. And also the technician, who has no feedback as to the location of this moving nub, that that in itself can tag the cornea. So technicians are not happy in doing this because of damage that can be done and it makes them nervous and the patients themselves can leave with a very red and inflamed eye. So while UBM has been around for 15 years or so commercially, it really hasn't caught on because of the drawbacks of that shell and gel technique. Ultrasound UBM is highly effective, it's cost effective. It's a cost effective way to look at the anterior aspects of the eye for a multitude of, of, of pathologies. Uh, aside from glaucoma, you can have phacomorphic or swollen lenses, you can have plateau iris, you can look for cysts and tumors and retinal tears as well as cells in the vitreous and vitreous hemorrhage in the anterior chamber. I want to show another device. This is an FDA approved device called the Clear Scan Cover. Basically it's a collar and a proprietary material here that is acoustically invisible. We're going to fill this full of water and we're going to push this on quickly onto the front of this probe. Again, this cover has to be in place or this, this clear scan will not secure. In the situation where the clear scan cover is pushed back onto this probe where this parting line is, that can cause a leak. If you do notice a leak, I would get some type of stretchy adhesive tape like Micropore and stretch it around here to cover that and that will prevent leaks. Let's just fill this up. Let me show you how easy it is to fill this. It requires, again, distilled water. I'm going to fill it up to the collar. I'm going to pour it in slowly to minimize the formation of bubbles. And here's the insertion process. That's all it takes. It takes just seconds. What's important in doing this exam is to maintain a conical bullet shape to the clear scan itself where it's in contact with the eye. I use this for aiming, especially an eye that has narrow fissures. And if it's too bulbous, it's gonna roll over the lids. There's an air bubble in here, but if you do the examination, you can see it rises to the top. It really doesn't make any difference whatsoever. What's a very important concept here in doing an examination is that the pressure within this bag has to be lower than the pressure of the eye. So the eye has pressure and this has pressure. And I wanna point out three advantages to using the clear scan. One is safety, the second is sterility, and the third is comfort. We'll just pretend that my palm is, is in the eye. Once you insert the probe into this bag, it's no longer a, a flaccid bag with zero pressure in it. It's pressurized, just like the pressurized tire 
of your car, holds your car off the ground, this is holding this away from the eye. So this gives you a safety feature because the more you push, then the more resistance there is in coming back. And if you look at your screen, if you see it's getting very close to the top of the screen, then you know you're probably pretty close to the cornea. But because of this feedback feature, it provides an important safety factor. Also, this is sterile for single use. Uh, there's a study that's being submitted to the literature and the manuscript deals with the issue of sterility. 34 people were tested, had a UBM on both eyes with four quadrants each eye, and then subsequent to the examination, the bag surface itself was swabbed, taken to the path lab, and what was found was that 80% of all the samples taken grew out microorganisms that were uh, associated with either inophthalmitis or keratitis. So this is a single-use device. In fact, if you just try to do the proverbial alcohol wipe for five or 10 seconds, it's been shown that 90% of RNA is still there. These are relatively inexpensive, and I would know that if I were a patient, I'd like to know that the bag used on me was sterile and not on the previous patient who could have any type of pathogen that potentially could be spread from patient to patient. We were talking about safety, sterility, and I want to address comfort. Comfort's a very important factor here. Um, because this is pressurized, if I'm rolling it on the eye like this, that the vector force is being spread over a large area. Um, a study was published uh, about two or three years ago, lead author Nick Bell, and we compared the use of this clear scan bag to the open shell on the same patient. And presentation was randomized, a clear scan or, or the open shell. And we had a rating scale of one to five, with a little smiley face on one end and then a, a frown on the other. And we asked patients to evaluate which, which they preferred the most. And just for 35 patients were in this study, all 35 per, preferred the bag, so it was unanimous. And on the numeric scale, in terms of comfort, it was, uh, when using a clear scan, it was right on the smiley part, around one, 1 1.5 of the five point scale, or it's like 2.7 to 2.9 on use of the uh, open shell. It was deemed adversive. And in clinical usage, I can definitely uh, attest to the fact that no patient finds this to be uncomfortable. On the clear scan collar, there are nubs placed uh, strategically around it. And this has a purpose of keeping the probe from rolling off onto the floor accidentally, causing a very expensive mistake. What's most important is, is to realize that if the pressure within this clear scan cover, within this bag itself, is higher than the pressure of the eye, well, several things will happen. One, you won't get complete coverage of the eye, which is important in a sulcus to sulcus examination. And also, you can dent the cornea. If someone has a pressure of like two or three, if they have like anterior effusions or choroidals, where the pressure is low in the eye, you can push that cornea straight down to the iris. And important safety tip, don't do that. There are three ways to alter pressure with, within this bag. One is you can change the fill amount. Instead of filling all the way up to the collar, you can put less fill in and push the probe in further. You can adjust back and forth that way, the fill pressure. A second way is to look on the side here. I can change pressure by inserting this further into the bag. I can lower pressure by, by pulling it out. Sometimes as, as, if I'm doing a scan, I'll see what appears to be like a furry appearance on the top of the cornea. Those are wrinkles. And to get rid of the wrinkles, and it's just aesthetics, because what's under the, the, the cornea is gonna be accurately measured. But just for aesthetic purposes, to eliminate that, you can, you can push that probe slightly in, and then they'll disappear because you've raised the pressure somewhat, eliminating the wrinkles. A third way to change pressure is by pinching this collar. This collar is more than just a, a sealing mechanism, but it functions as a valve also. Right now there's an air bubble in here. If I wanna lower pressure or get rid of an air bubble, I can just squeeze the side of this. You saw the water escape. You can start to see wrinkles here. I can do this uh, again. And now you can clearly see some wrinkles on the side of here. And in fact, you might want to have as little as pressure as possible in an eye that has two or three millimeters of mercury. It would appear very wrinkled and also flaccid sort of moving downward here. And we're ready for the exam. I've maintained the conical bullet shape, which is imperative. So we're ready to do an exam.
What I'd like to do is give a quick overview of the function buttons on the Reflex UBM. The first button at the top is the Start a New Patient button. The second button is the folder of all the previous exams. The third button is going to be the Save button for the exam that was just performed. Then you have the Printer button. And then you have the additional Functional Modality button. This is how you switch from the right eye to the left eye. This is your gain. This is the clock hour so you can orient yourself on the screen. This is the zoom button that allows you to go up in 50% increments each time. This is the diminish button. This is the pan button that allows you to move the image around on the screen. And then, if you get disoriented or you want to go back to the original, you just touch that button and everything will reset to the original parameters. This is how you save JPEG images. So if you click there, an image will appear here. In here is the patient data you need to store prior to beginning the exam. You need to have a first name, last name, and the birth date is day, month, year, followed by male and female. These are manipulation tools. This is how you measure the angle. This is the surface area. This is the first caliper. This is the second caliper. If you choose to write a note on the screen, you click that button and you can add in any additional data. This is clear function. This is to export a JPEG image. This form shows where the best and highest resolution image will occur on the screen. And this is the individual A scan that occurs with each individual sweep during the UBM. This is the start scan mode. You have idle and you have record mode. This slider affects the voltage going to the probe. Generally, that's left at 100%. And then you have three different sweep angles. You have 35 degrees, 25 degrees, and 15 degrees. And after you've finished with the exam, to review, this is how you play the images that were just recorded. You can advance them one at a time by using these buttons back and forth until you find the data that you would like to review and or save. These controls should be used in unison to adjust the brightness and contrast in order to optimize the appearance of the image. The very first step in conducting an examination is to put one or two drops of topical anesthetic into the eye. Look up for me. We're going to give that a few seconds to work. Okay, subsequent to the numbing drop, we're going to do an examination of the temporal angle right here. It's important. Look straight. I want you to follow my finger. If I'm looking at the temporal angle, I'm going to have the patient look slightly inward, like this. Look through my finger and find a spot on the wall. you notice I'm doing this examination with the patient sitting up. This is the same orientation as the ophthalmologist or optometrist might have when they're examining a patient. Therefore, that the subsequent UBM images that are captured are gonna correlate more highly than if the patient were laying down. Look through my finger and find a spot. I do what's called the faux speculum technique. I want the fissures to be open, but I don't, do not want to increase pressures within the eye. I'm gonna take my left hand, push it up to the bony brow, and look at my fingers. They're curved here, sort of like a tower of fingers, I'm going to pull down with these fingers with the same hand that I have my probe. Okay, look right here. I have my finger on this ridge on the side of the probe. I'm aiming very carefully, and then I'm going to look at my screen. Okay. There's as long as it took it to get an image. Stop and freeze that. So, and looking in the screen here, before we do any alteration of contrast or brightness or magnification, here's the edge of the bag rolling off the side of the eye. Here's scleral tissue. 
This line right here denotes a different type of tissue, uveal tissue here, and that's the line right there. Here's a ciliary body. You can see the sulcus. Here's the iris. Here's some zonules. Here's the uh, posterior aspect of the cornea, endothelial cell layer. Up here is epithelial. Notice there are some of those wrinkles that I had talked about before. Now to eliminate those, you just push the probe in slightly to, into the bag to increase pressures. I want to do this one more time. I want to show you how to identify an, 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 the angle, whether it's open or closed. That didn't hurt, did it? Oh, a little cool. Like a cool balloon. Mm -hmm. I'm pushing down. I can go way on the side of the eye. That's the big advantage here for looking for pathologies on the side of the eye. Okay, let's freeze that. My criteria for an adequate scan is I have to have a landmark in each picture. That landmark is the pupil being open. I don't want to be above the pupil or below the pupil. I always want to go through the pupil, which is evident right here. I'm going to look at the inferior angle. I'm going to have the patient look slightly up look through my finger. The line is going to be facing at 6 o'clock down here. In my images, I always like to have the sclera on the left and the anterior chamber on the right. There's an optimal position on the screen that denotes where the greatest sensitivity is. And so I want to have the angle or whatever I'm interested in, be it a, a cyst or a melanoma, on, pictured on that line, on that little dotted yellow line. I'm going to use that faux speculum technique, look up. I'm looking at that conical bullet. Everything looks well positioned. Now I'll go look at my screen. Freeze that. Do that one more time. I want to get, freeze that. There, I'm right at the optimal spot. And I want to have the same orientation in my resultant picture as I'm looking at the patient. I want the left-hand side of my picture to be temporal. I want the right-hand side to be nasal for the right eye. I'm going to have the line facing temporally and going across the eye, and that will give me that same orientation. If I move to the left eye, I keep the same orientation. On the left eye, the line's going to be facing the nose, and the opposite side, where there is no line, will be facing the ear. And I have the same orientation of, uh, of nasal and temporal, as if I were just looking at the patient under a slit lamp. Why don't you look straight ahead right here? Find a spot. Again, this faux speculum technique. I'm going to use this conical bullet to get everything lined up. Everything looks good. Freeze that. You can see with these examinations, it takes just seconds to do. And let me ask my patient on a comfort scale of one being most comfortable and five being most adversive, where would you place this? I would say one. Okay.